Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mighty Plan Zero webinar. Uh, we're just going to wait one more minute for people to finish joining and then we'll be underway. Morning all, for those of you who are just joining, we're just waiting one more minute uh, for people to join and then we'll get in, be getting started. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mighty Plan Zero webinar. Uh, and today we are focused on electric vehicle infrastructure. My name is Simon King. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Social Value at Mighty. Uh, and on the infrastructure piece, whenever I'm asked about transitioning to electric vehicles, I always say that there are seven areas that you need to focus on. One of them is vehicles. One of them is driver awareness and behavior. And the other five are all about infrastructure across home, across workplace, across public data and management information, and then a scalable solution, which links in to all of your other uh, plan zero or zero carbon or renewable energy strategies. So today, that's exactly the uh, answers that we will be going to. The idea is that this webinar is very much focused on solutions, not problems. Uh, and so I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by some of the, the leading experts in EVs and EV infrastructure uh, on the webinar today to talk through uh, a whole range of those areas. So we've got Charlie Jardine from EO talking about home charging. I'll talk about office charging uh, and future proof strategy. Sam Clark from GridServe talking about public charging uh, and the rollout of electric vehicles. Chris Wright from Moixa talking about value through optimization software. Uh, and all of that data piece that I've just referenced. And then delighted that Alexis has joined us from Yorkshire Ambulance to talk about kind of how it all comes together uh, and in a particularly challenging scenario uh, around blue light services. We will have a Q&A section at the end uh, and there is a session uh, for everybody, uh, opportunity, sorry, for everyone to put their Q&As in. If you look down the bottom of your screen, you should have both a Q&A button and a chat button. Uh, if you can use the, the chat button uh, for everybody, uh, then that would be uh, that would be great uh, for if you want to chat to other members. But the Q&A piece uh, is really where if you can put any questions you've got for the panelists in there, that would be very much appreciated. OK, so thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, I'm now just going to, uh, if I could just pause for one second before I hand over to, to Charlie, just to make sure that uh, everyone uh, can hear us okay. We've just had a message to suggest that some people have not got uh, audio or not able to hear us live. So before I hand over to our first presenter, I'll just ask a couple of people in the chat just to say, yes, great, um, or uh, let us know if you've got an issue, because it would be disappointing to hand over such an expert as Charlie. I can see loads and loads of chat comments going all good, which is wonderful. Uh, so if you can't hear us, apologies, but it sounds as though it is working for most people. So uh, maybe just try logging out and logging back in again, see if that works for you, the great IT solution. Um, so with that and focusing very much on solutions and, and the home charging area, I'm now delighted to hand across to Charlie uh, from EO. Over to you. Thanks, Simon. Morning, everyone. So I'm Charlie Jardine founder, CEO at EO Charging. We make charging stations and software for electric vehicles with a specific focus on fleet. So, so Mighty kindly asked me to come and talk about how we charge a return to home fleet at home on people's driveways. So obviously, you know, Mighty is a great example. I guess Simon will keep me honest here, but they've probably got about a thousand EVs on fleet. And these vehicles have the opportunity to go back to people's driveways overnight. And the nice thing about EVs, obviously, 
is if you have a driveway, or even if you don't, uh, you have the ability to plug the vehicle in overnight. So I think uh, you know, the, the, the basic principle, principle about electric is being able to plug in every time the vehicle is parked allows you to obviously regain a meaningful amount of charge. And, and of course, in a overnight home environment, you might have eight to 10 hours to 12 hours where your vehicle is stationary and you can, assuming you can plug in, basically get a full recharge. So again, what, what I want to talk about is, is how we do that. So if we jump to the next slide, please. That's me. So um, if you think about a typical fleet, you know, vehicles are traveling uh, typically less than 40 miles per day. There might be instances where you've got vehicles doing 100 miles, maybe more, but the majority, majority of, of, of driving, yeah, it, it's certainly less than 100 miles per day. And actually, if you have an EV, again, that goes back to someone's driveway for 8 to 10 to 12 hours, a typical home charging station, which would be 7 kilowatts or 32 amps, can give a EV typically 20 miles of recharge per hour. So 20 times 8 or 12, if you have a longer dwell time, of course, gives you that full recharge. So it's just practical. Uh, of course, not everyone's got a driveway, but a lot of the, the mighty drivers do. And so you know, for us, the way that we work with Mighty and others is we can go out and supply and install a home charging station. Obviously, you've got the charger. You then need it installed. Currently, there's support from the government. They're providing a grant to the value of £350. So for about £550 inclusive of that, you can have a, a home charging station installed. Um, so, you know, practically it's, it's, it, it makes sense. Uh, and then actually from a cost perspective, it's also way cheaper. So if you buy typically at home energy for anywhere between five pence and 15 and, and, and maybe 20 pence per kilowatt hour, actually, you know, the cost of recharging a hundred miles, you know, five pounds to 10 pounds, is, is, is pretty insignificant when you compare that against uh, obviously petrol or diesel, but equally comparing that against charging in public at certain locations, there is a, a massive cost difference. So as well as being pract practical and convenient, you know, it's also cost effective. If we go to the next slide, of course, the... Uh, the consideration if you are giving your employees EVs, vans or cars going back to home, uh, you know, we need to be able to install a charging station. Um, I'm, I'm talking very much here about uh, situations where you have a driveway and that's where the government can support. I'll come on to later uh, situations where you haven't necessarily got a charger on your driveway and, and thus rely on public charging. I'm sure Sam will talk in a bit more detail about that as well. Um, again, there's a grant to the value of £350. Um, you know, it's helpful, but it's it's not uh, you know it's not it's not massive. It's 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 still meaning though that a charger will cost £550 rather than you know, nearing nearing a thousand. So um, cost to implement again is, is is pretty low. I think if we go to the next slide, the uh, the consideration that people are trying to wrap their heads around is okay. Well. You know, my drivers are now using their own energy to refuel a work vehicle. And, and, and the consideration for a business like Mighty or others is how do I reimburse my drivers for charging at home? So typically you've got three options. So option number one is the government advised that uh, we reimburse drivers four pence per mile which obviously is a, is a meaningful discount against the advice for petrol or diesel. That's, that's super simple. A lot of fleets will have uh, telematics or other means to track the mileage, the daily mileage of an employee. 
Um, alternatively, you can, with uh, smart charging stations, uh, we, we make them, the government will only uh, part fund smart chargers and smart means they have an internet connection. So what you can do through that is track the number of kilowatts consumed by a vehicle. You can see you know, what time of day the vehicle was plugged in and, and, un and unplugged. You can see, you know, uh, yeah, again, if, if we understand from the driver and in our app, for example, they can tell us which energy tariff they're on, we can actually specifically see how much each charging session has cost them. So you know, through a, uh, a product like ours or some of our competitors, you can see again, basically energy used, cost of energy, and you might extract that data through the platform that we offer or via an API, and then your business might decide to work out independently of the platform, how they're gonna reimburse drivers. So you might already have some accounting software or expense management software that if you take that data out of the product and the software that we offer, you can then uh, you know, reimburse the drivers independently of, of, of our platform. The third way, which is what Mighty have been implementing, is an automatic reimbursement tool. So we use a tool called MENA. And the way MENA works is uh, when we go out and install a charging station, so a home charger on someone's driveway, we get obviously the serial number of the charging station. We get uh, from the driver what energy tariff they're on. They, uh, they take a picture of their energy bill, specifically the QR code that allows us to understand exactly what tariff they're on, what the price of energy is. And ultimately what MENA is doing is it's using the data from our charging station uh, to pay the energy company directly for the EV energy usage. So one of the things you might find is drivers that get, get given EVs, if they're going home, charging their EV every night of the week, then suddenly their energy bill goes from maybe 50 pounds a month to suddenly a hundred pounds a month and suddenly they got bill shock. Uh, and so what MENA does is rather than give your drivers this bill shock, they're actually paying the energy company directly for the EV energy usage. So you get the same bill. It says, you know, 50 pounds for my house, 50 pounds for my EV, but actually the 50 pounds for my EV is already being prepaid. So me as the driver are left just to pay my standard 50 quid. And then what me are doing is they're doing that for me, Charlie, and all the other drivers on the fleet. And then they're passing back to the business, Mighty, for example, one invoice that's done all of the prepayments for all of the drivers. And so Mighty can just pay one invoice uh, to cover all of their employees that have been given return to home charging stations. So it's a re really neat tool. Um, of course, it comes with a cost, but ultimately, you know, a, an operation like Mighty, who's starting to do this electrification at scale, needs to consider whether they want resource on their side to manage this, you know, overhead people, or whether they want somebody like us to provide them with a one-stop shop turnkey solution. And so again, you know, you've got three options there. Uh, mean is mean is a pretty useful tool. Um, if we go to the next slide, the 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 only other thing to consider is, I've talked about home charging. Of course, not everyone's got a driveway, uh, and even if you do have a driveway, there might be instances where your vehicle needs to travel more than you know 100 miles plus in a day. And therefore, there might be instances where you need to use the public network. So, so what we do is we have what we call the EO charge card. The EO charge card is an RFID tag that allows drivers to use about 15 of the UK's public charging networks. 15 equates to over 50% of public charging stations across the UK. And drivers can go to the public charging points they can just tap the RFID to start, go out, do their work, come back, tap to unplug, 
And rather than pay at the pump or pay at the charging station, actually that data is recorded, their energy usage, usage is recorded. Obviously each network charges a different price. So akin to how I described the home solution, we'll pay the network operator for the EV energy usage on their charging stations directly. And then within that one invoice at the end of the month, we can illustrate what the drivers used at home, what the drivers use on the go. And again, give that back to the business so mighty, and then they can pay the one invoice like described earlier. So again, you know, what we're trying to do here is, is, is uh, create a really simple and seamless experience for your drivers. Because as Simon said, you know, getting the, the vehicles on fleet is a challenge, getting the infrastructure to support that is a challenge, but then also making it really, really easy for your drivers to use these vehicles efficiently. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also a challenge. So yeah, hopefully what I've, I've uh, explained makes sense. Of course, we're here at the end to take any questions, but yeah, you know, where you have driveways, I would suggest looking at deploying home charging infrastructure, because when you look at that cost, and practicality against deploying workplace or depot charging versus forcing drivers to use the public network, you know, it, it, it just makes a lot of sense. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, yeah, look forward to any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, great overview from, from a home point of view. Uh, and, and on the, the, the point about the, the paying directly at home that's really important for us um, with the commercial vehicle rollout which I mentioned because we don't want there to be a cash flow impact on, on our commercial vehicle drivers. Uh, also just to point out for those of you who haven't seen it in the chat Mark Moore's kindly put a link in with some details about the uh, government's plug-in car and van grants if you're not already aware of that then the uh, link is in the chat. So I'm just going to briefly talk about office charging uh, and ensuring a future-proof strategy in that uh, space. Uh, so if we could move on to the first slide, please, just to kind of explain why I think that we can potentially add some value to you in, in this area. So Mighty's own electric vehicle journey. We've now got over 1,350 uh, electric vehicles on the road. It goes up by between 25 and 30 a week. Uh, so the, uh, the slide struggled to keep up, uh, but you know, we're, we're very proud of, of how many vehicles we've got on the fleet so far. Um, that makes the largest pure electric fleet in the UK. We've got about 7,200 vehicles in total. Uh, and so clearly we've still got a long way to go to transition everything across, but we're committed as part of Plan Zero to being at net zero operational uh, emissions by 2025, by the end of 2025. And so our entire fleet, uh, wherever the technology allows, will be zero carbon by that date as well. I think you know, we have to be realistic and say that there's probably a couple of uh, vehicles or a few vehicles types where the technology may not be there, but generally everything is moving across. We see that that makes sense from a, a planet point of view. Clearly, it's a massive reduction in, in emissions. Uh, it's a huge uh, benefit as well from a clean air perspective. Uh, it works for our employees because there's a significant benefit in kind saving for those of them who are uh, using the vehicles privately. Clearly lines up well with the policy changes that we're seeing, whether that be the ban on internal combustion engine sales from 2030, uh, whether that be the increasing requirement to report on things like TCFD, uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure and others. Uh, and it has a huge impact on our, our operational emissions. Uh, and it's also the right thing from a pocket point of view. Now, you heard Charlie mention the difference in pence per mile, the AER, the advisory electricity rate, as opposed to the AFR, the advisory fuel rate. That gives some sort of indication as to the fuel saving that you see. It's typically about a third of the cost to run electric than it is diesel in our experience uh, for, from a fuel point of view. And there's also national insurance contribution savings uh, for those vehicles which have private use as well. Uh, and SMR, service maintenance and repair savings. So there's lots of benefits that we've seen uh, from moving to a pure electric fleet. As you can see, we've installed a large number of charge points, both at employees' homes uh, and also across commercial premises, both mighty and client premises. Okay, so just some of the things to consider on the next slide. Uh, the 
first thing uh, is to think about where your vehicles sleep. So I would say this is absolutely critical to you know, making sure you've got the right infrastructure. Now, mighty vehicles do significantly more than the national average. They do about 18,000 miles a year on average. Uh, but on average, that fleet, so the commercial fleet, where we've got the full telematics and we can see exactly what's happening, average about two hours, 16 minutes driving each day. Um, and so the vast majority of the time, they're not going anywhere, they're parked up. And so where is that sleep location? If you can identify the bit where it's off shift, where you know, the vehicle is recovering as the driver is, then that is the optimal place to put your charging infrastructure. And that's why we primarily uh, have focused on the home charging solution for our own fleet, because that is where our vehicles sleep. 90% of them are home-based. And so if you can get the charging there, then every morning they start the day fully charged uh, and therefore can do the full range uh, and maximize the opportunity to deliver uh, the, the, the distance that's required from those vehicles. Uh, my example is always the, the humble mobile phone. Um, back in the days when we used to go out and about regularly, uh, you know, I'm sure you used to charge your mobile phone up overnight next to your bed, wherever, then start the day, go out with your mobile phone, you know, use it during the day, come back, plug it in at the end of the day and repeat. And electric vehicles are exactly the same. Um, occasionally, you might need to top them up and, and we'll come on to, uh, to that with Sam in a moment. So that's where I would say the primary uh, area should be for putting your charging infrastructure in place. The second part then is what's the need state that you are looking to meet at things like workplace charging? So is it a top up? So are you expecting vehicles to uh, primarily be charged overnight, but then maybe need a top up use during the, the, the day um, while they're visiting those locations? Uh, and if so, how long are those vehicles going to be stopped for at those locations, which will give you some sort of indication as to the, the charge rate that you need. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, with seven kilowatt charging, then if a vehicle is parked up for 10, 12 hours, then you know, you'll be putting in somewhere between 60 and 80 kilowatt hours of, of charge, which will fill up virtually all of the electric vehicles that are on the road. But if they're only stopping for an hour, uh, how much charge do you need to get in at that point? Is it purely a convenience piece? So for offices, this is often the case that it's more convenience uh, and providing a service to employees or visitors who may have had long journeys or don't necessarily have their own charging infrastructure at home. Now, if that's the case, then something like a seven kilowatt charger is almost certainly going to be uh, absolutely fit for purpose uh, because the, the vehicles will be there for most of the day or for a reasonable period of time. And you're really just providing a convenient solution to provide a little bit of extra charge. It could be that what you're trying to do is actually attract people to your site. So if you're a retailer, for example, that you want to have uh, charging that people come to that location for the, the charge uh, and therefore, while they're there, they also use your, your other facilities. Uh, and in that case, you're probably looking to attract people for short periods of time and therefore provide them with a very high charge rate um, so that they can uh, be at that uh, your location for a short period. Um, and you get potentially some revenue from the charging, but also the uh, additional revenue from using your services. And if you're looking at those kind of locations, then you're probably looking at 50 kilowatt plus rapid DC charging. Or it could be that actually your workplace is your primary charge location. If you're running a depot based fleet, for example, then you will absolutely need to be charging those at the, uh, the site. Uh, and again, understanding what the capacity of those batteries are, how long the dwell time is or the sleeping time is at that location will give you a really clear indication of the, the charge requirements. So understanding that need state is crucial. It's not just about well, vehicles are parked here, therefore we must charge them. Uh, often vehicles, even if they're electric, can be quite happily parked, but have received their primary charge somewhere else and not need the top up. If you can move on to the next slide. Uh, then, so when we're looking at what the solutions are, uh, as I've just been talking about, understanding that EV fleet size, the vehicle types and the use patterns is crucial. Uh, so looking at your mileage analysis, looking at telematics and understanding what the, uh, the situation is for your particular fleet. 
whatever the solution is that's putting in place, it needs to be a really open and flexible managed electric vehicle charging system because you're going to need maintenance, you're going to need support over the period of time. And you're also going to need to understand what management information you get from that system to allow the deduction or reimbursement mechanisms uh, to work. Um, so and Charlie talked a bit about those in home. Clearly, you also need to have that same information available from, from a workplace so that you can have that integrated solution for your fleets. I think really also, uh, if you particularly if you're going to be putting a large amount of charging capacity into a location, then renewable power generation options can be uh, very valuable to, to assess, as well as them providing broader uh, renewable credentials. Uh, and also potentially being a uh, cost saving for your, your whole electricity uh, requirement, uh, that can also help you increase the capacity that you can put into electric charging uh, with on-site storage being uh, a solution that we've seen in several uh, locations work well. Now, the capacity is crucial for particularly for a workplace uh, environment. Lots of businesses will have optimized their capacity over time and so don't have much headroom on the capacity coming into that location. So that coming back to that need state when you need to be charging and having load balancing solutions, uh, it will help you massively because if you can charge the vehicles when the office or the warehouse is not using much electricity, then actually you end up with a really neat balance. And if you look at the grid as a whole, that's primarily what's expected to happen, that the charging happens overnight mainly uh, while most of our energy use is during the day. And so actually electric vehicles can help balance the, the use. And so if you can have, have those kind of solutions in the workplace, that's optimal. But if not, you can have low balancing solutions that dial down the speed of charge to ensure that you get as much charging as you can without breaching your capacity limits at site. Uh, linked into infrastructure is just things about driver engagement, training and awareness. Everyone kind of has grown up knowing how to fill up diesel vehicles or petrol vehicles, knowing how to deal with petrol stations. Um, and it's not the case with electric vehicles. People don't automatically know what to do. So there are things like people haven't always realised that if you want to use a rapid charger, you have to use a different connector to if you're using a, a type two fast charger. Um, as well as the how to drive and so on. So making sure that there's a full engagement plan uh, and explaining to drivers what's required, uh, the importance of driving sensibly, not accelerating or braking hard, using the regenerative braking and so on will, will help you uh, with your infrastructure as well. Then making sure that you use the data so you consider uh, how do you future-proof your solution? Just because you only need two charge points today does that mean you'll only need two in 2025 or 2030? And so assessing that requirement is really important because typically the, the most uh, expensive part of your workplace charging infrastructure is connecting it into the disk boards and doing the groundworks, and you only want to do that once. So if you can get that infrastructure underground in place, then you can always add more charge points uh, as you go along. And just remember, it's a lot more than a plug. Um, so having a bit of a think about it and potentially bringing in some expertise from outside um, then uh, could really help you come up with the right uh, solution. Just one suggestion is if you are looking to buy in solutions, just check that people have actually done it themselves. There's an awful lot of experts out there at the moment uh, who haven't got electric vehicles on their fleet. So please do have a think about whether you want to do all the work yourself or buy it in. But please go with people who've got some expertise and have done it. Uh, so I'll now hand over to Sam to talk about public charging. No problem. Good morning, Simon and everybody, and thank you very much. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for that. That's, that's, that's hugely interesting. So uh, thank you to Mighty for uh, inviting me on to, to talk about public infrastructure. Uh, my name is Sam Clark. I'm the Chief Vehicle Officer for GridServe Sustainable Energy. Um, I also ran my own last mile delivery company with a fully electric fleet in London for 10 years previously as well. So um, I've, uh, I've enjoyed electric vehicles for, for several decades now. Um, so um, next slide, please, Lucy. So um, yeah, what I wanted to talk about today was, was public infrastructure, um, but just very briefly, just to give a little bit of context in terms of what I think is important um, is the entire supply chain in regards to electrification of our fleets. Um, so at GridServe, we don't just build um, electric forecourts and public infrastructure, which I'll come on to shortly, um, but we also 
uh, create, own and operate uh, large solar battery hybrid solar farms as well. So uh, these two images here is, is uh, not just an illustration of what's possible, but what's actually reality in terms of providing a sun to wheel uh, logic uh, for, for energy needs. So um, everyone's familiar with well to wheel, um, which is the concept really of, of oil extraction and burning lots of oil to, to transport it and then refine it and burn it again. Uh, and then transport it again, put it into a petrol station and then burn it again uh, and waste 70% of the energy um, in heat. Uh, so we want to get away with away from well to wheel logic and digging things up out of the ground and harvesting energy from the sun uh, instead to, to achieve the same same objectives. So um, that, those these two images here is, uh, is me quite literally plugging into the sun or as close to as possible, I suppose. Um, and this is one of our farms up in up in York. Um, but uh, not everybody has a uh, several acre solar farm at their disposal to charge with. But um, we just I just wanted to sort of highlight um, that not just the infrastructure, but where the energy comes from is equally important. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, GridServe on the energy side, so the well to wheel, but the wheel part, um, we are building uh, electric forecourts around the UK, uh, the first of which I shall touch on shortly. Uh, which is the illustration image on the left uh, and uh, as of about two or three weeks ago um, we also acquired 100 percent control and ownership of the electric highway uh, formerly uh, owned by ecotricity um, so the grid serve now have um, 169 locations around the uk which we're currently upgrading um, which are the effectively the 169 most strategically placed um, charges on the map given that they are predominantly at uh, 85 percent of of the UK service station network. So uh, we've got an awful lot of work to do to upgrade that now, to, to put it into uh, into a, a position of, of uh, reliability and functionality for, for our users. Um, Ecotricity pioneered this network some 10 years ago, um, but it has uh, somewhat stalled in the last few years. And uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have um, went into partnership with them originally and then, and then subsequently have acquired the network in order to deliver a, um, a new solution now for, for the road users. Um, many years into the future and indeed the image the sunset image on the right hand side there is our most recent installation at rugby uh, with 12 350 kilowatt charges at that new service station there um, so so we're very much now in the thick of it as one of the major players in terms of delivering public infrastructure uh, for the masses going forward uh, next slide please as far as the forecourts are concerned, um, as something that GridServe has been designing and engineering for, for many, many years uh, in terms of trying to produce something of a public infrastructure for the masses uh, for the future. And this was the image that um, was, was banded around by us a few years ago in terms of what our concept looked like uh, for a electric forecourt. Uh, we wanted something that created lots of uh, retail concessions that had lots of charges, lots of functionality, uh, usability, reliability, accessibility. Um, for as many people as possible. So that's what the concept looked like. Um, and if you keep watching the screen, if you see, just click once more, you'll see what the reality looks like, um, which is indeed very similar. So we're very proud and, and happy to have produced this, this first electric forecourt in Braintree in Essex. Uh, next click along, please. Um, so this is uh, what we think uh, the, the country needs uh, in abundance, as well as the electric highway on the strategic road network. We also need to produce um, locations that can support fleets like Mighty's um, and everybody else in between. Uh, so this particular site opened up in early December last year. Um, it has uh, 36 charges, um, 30 of which are high power DC charging. Uh, as I said, two storey building, uh, twin solar canopy, a five megawatt grid connection and six megawatt hours of, of battery storage on site, which in layman's terms translates to around 24,000 miles of driving energy distributable at any given time. Um, so we feel very strongly that this is the sort of infrastructure that for those of uh, those of us or the millions of people out there that don't have off street parking, um, or indeed those that do but are on longer journeys need to find solutions in order to charge whilst on the move. Uh, and this very much is, is our plan to roll out um, over 100 of these around the next, the next five years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, actually, uh, thank you. So um, these are just some of the images which I've taken in my journeys over the last uh, over the last few years. Um, and and as, as uh, Simon said at the beginning, we want to highlight solutions, not problems. But um, in terms of providing some context for for where um, public charging infrastructure needs to improve, um, my top line images here when I was driving around in my i3 all successful charges, um, but one is me pointing the wrong way down a one way road, uh, the other one parked in a flower bed and the other one parked in a cycle lane. Um, so 
it's uh, not always strategic, the, the charging points are not always strategically placed to, to, uh, to support everybody. Um, so there are elements of, of needing to get smarter in the way that we position charges and, the, and where they're placed to make sure that we're able to support all sorts of different types of driver uh, and fleets. Uh, and indeed the two images at the bottom, two fantastic locations, one at Hammersmith Flyover, one in, in Darts Farm in Exeter. Um, the one on the left obviously is full of taxis and the one on the right is full of Teslas. Um, so I wasn't able to charge my Tesla on my journey uh, because it was oversubscribed at that particular point, which in fairness was a Friday afternoon on the bank holiday weekend. So um, even when there is good infrastructure out there, um, quite often it's oversubscribed um, and therefore that's a challenge in itself. Uh, so these are the sort of challenges that we need to try and overcome in my humble opinion. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so there's definitions here, which I just wanted to, to highlight slightly um, because um, we see lots of pins on maps, um, which I'm coming to in a second as well, but um, I'm just wanted to highlight the, defi the differences between a connector, a device and a location. So a connector is obviously the thing you plug into your vehicle. Um, on average, there are around two connectors per device and around two devices per location um, on the high powered uh, network in the UK. But typically the, the connector types, um, uh, you, you can only really use one connector um, on one device. So really the, the, the critical number is the number of devices that we have out there at the moment. Um, and, and so not all, not all locations you see on the map um, are quite the same. Next slide, please. So I've just used two examples here, uh, two, two both GridServe, um, albeit it says Ecotricity, but um, that's, now, that's now under uh, GridServe ownership. But these are just two, two examples of where, um, or in my title there, not all pins are created equal. So two pins on the map that demonstrate um, the ability to charge, uh, one of which is, a, is one device um, in, in Newmarket Heath, uh, and the other one is, is 30 high power chargers uh, in Braintree as well as a Tesla supercharger bank of another six on top of that. So, so two pins on the map can mean very, very different things. Um, and on that note, next slide, please. Um, I've just taken some ZapMap information here just to sort of break down what the charging infrastructure looks like in the UK. So, so number one on the left hand side, there are all the pins of all the public charges available in the UK today. Um, 15,000 locations, um, 41,000 connectors. And so there's so many charges out there um, that it literally blocks out the, uh, the UK. Um, but critically, 24,000 devices. Um, however, a lot of those, as you'll see by the colouring, um, there's a lot of blue and a lot of red, uh, which means a lot of them aren't working, uh, and a lot of them are low power chargers, which aren't the ones you're going to want to use when you're on the move. Moving over, therefore, to number two, uh, which is what, where we've got over 100 kilowatt um, power, which is a reasonable amount of power, and, and, and most vehicles today on the roads, electric vehicles on the road today, um, are, are at that sort of level on average in terms of their capacity to take charge. Uh, that breaks us down to around 4,000 devices uh, in the UK. And then on the right-hand side, number three, is, is the big ticket stuff, the 350 kilowatts that, that no car on the road today can currently take. Um, I think the Porsche Taycan is about 280 at peak. Uh, having said that, we've got things like the Hyundai um, Ionic 5 coming through, which is also a, a very, uh, on an 800 volt platform vehicle, which can take very high charges um, in a, comfortably in a two, 230, I think, kilowatt speed. So the, the type of vehicles coming along into the marketplace now are demanding higher and higher power. Um, so the number of 350 kilowatt um, locations in the UK currently are 17. Now, the 350 kilowatt chargers are very high powered, can charge a vehicle, put a couple of hundred miles of meaningful charge into a, into a vehicle in, in 20, 25 minutes, which is probably the closest thing to a petrol station environment whereby you would pull up and, and fill up with, with fuel at the pump. Um, so of those 17 locations, and this is incredibly hard data to find, I had to click on every pin and count these numbers myself because it's not actually displayed anywhere, but um, 17 locations, 142 connectors and 85 devices around the UK. Um, and, and I put asterisks there because 54 of those um, locations um, are, are, sorry, 54 of the connectors are, are at two of grid serve locations and 36 devices are at two of the grid serve locations. So we've got a long way to go to put infrastructure into place that enables uh, high power charging strategically where it needs to be for, for the masses. So if we look at 8,000 odd petrol stations in the UK, um, arguably uh, we've got 85 devices that are capable to make a comparable um, comparison to those petrol stations. So I think that just highlights for me at least um, where we need to be or where we need to go in order to try and deliver a, a much higher um, level of uh, infrastructure for the masses going forward. Um, so that's that's a sort of overview of, of how I wanted to look at or how I wanted to present my my take on public infrastructure at the moment. It's not to say it's not 
it's not fantastic. Uh, it, it's growing all of the time and it really is amazing. And, and everybody that's doing all the charcoal operators putting things in the ground are doing a fantastic job at it. Uh, but we need to we need to accelerate it now to support the uptake of EVs over the next few years. Um, and my final slide, please, Lucy, thank you. Um, it's just a little bit more about the vehicles themselves. So um, it's um, whilst we've got a lot of work to do on the on the infrastructure, it's also important to understand there's the circa 36 million registered cars and, and low um, like commercial vehicles out there on the road today and just under a quarter of a million uh, pure electric vehicles. So as a proportion of the overall um, number of vehicles on the road, we're, we're somewhere in the region of one to two percent um, at present. These numbers are changing all of the time, so it's quite hard to keep up on a, on a, on a presentation slide. But uh, we're somewhere in the region of one to two percent of, of pure electric uh, vehicles on the road today. Um, so we've still got a little bit of time uh, to try and build this infrastructure out um, as the uptake of EVs uh, continues to accelerate, especially given we've got bans on petrol and diesel in 2030. Um, we've got uh, statistics coming out now about cost parity between electric and and uh, and ICE uh, internal combustion engine vehicles by 2027. They are already cheaper uh, to run uh, on a total cost of ownership model, uh, but on a capital asset value, uh, we think the cost parity will be around 2027, which will which will help a lot of people understand, I think, better the, the opportunity there. Um, and of course, a lot of money is also going into the, the green fund in order to try and upgrade the, the, the cabling in the ground in order to support um, ourselves and others in putting more high power charges in, into the ground. Uh, and then just the last bit on the right hand side is just some statistics on on, uh, on vehicle registrations. Um, the top right was, was from the SMMT figures in April this year. Um, and, and they don't really help much uh, because of COVID uh, and the fact that we're in this huge um, uh, sort of re regrowth stage of, of car and van registrations in the UK. The numbers have gone skewed, uh, which is what the uh, the orange box is indicating here. There's just the the the, the percentage increases are are so difficult to to appraise at the moment based on the current climate. Uh, however, the table on the bottom right um, I took at the very end of last year, uh, and what is encouraging is to see that whilst there was obviously a a huge decline in vehicle registrations for internal combustion engines uh, throughout the lockdown of last year. Uh, the battery electric vehicles stay strong throughout. Um, in fact, there was a positive increase in registrations uh, year to date, um, despite lockdown throughout last year. So um, these, these, this data needs to be taken with a bit of pinch of salt because it was a period of all of our lives where, where things were a little bit, a little bit unusual. Uh, but it nonetheless was, was encouraging to see the, uh, the uptake of EVs uh, stayed strong throughout, throughout that year. Um, so, so that's really um, my, my overall summary in terms of public infrastructure, a little bit about the vehicles and just my, my, uh, my thoughts on that and I can see in the corner of my eye uh, a lot of comments coming through as well so I look forward to reading those shortly um, but thank you for that and I shall now pass over to Chris I believe um, for the next presentation. Good morning, um, <clears throat> next slide, uh, next slide. So um, just to set the context, um, as, a, as a company, uh, Moiks are, are highly focused on how we can make a difference to the climate emergency. Next slide. And we build a lot of sort of advanced technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning technology um, in order to add intelligence, because we believe that by increasing the IQ of batteries, um, that we can be a big part of enabling a future powered by renewables. So all of the th work that we do is really focused around that mission. Next. So just to give you <clears throat> a couple of examples and show how we're building technology that goes across, when I say batteries, I mean batteries in cars, but also batteries in homes and in businesses. So this is a view of our dashboard um, of our fleet in um, Japan rolled out with a, a Japanese corporate called Itochu, where we have about, um, they always out of date these numbers on slides, but I think about 29,000 systems now connected to our platform, around about 300 megawatt hours of, of storage, um, you know, gigawatts of, of energy going hither and thus, and we're able to connect to all of those systems and control them. Um, both for uh, to ensure that they deliver the most value that they can, but also to enable them to be dispatched for fleet services so that you can um, turn on or off um, 100 megawatts of power from 
devices distributed in homes rather than ramping up a peak power plant powered by gas. Uh, next slide. This is an example of the of, of what we do. So this is um, some data um, data science that we did against our own fleet. Um, not the entire twenty nine thousand, but I think there was about a thousand units that we used for this analysis, where we looked at what the energy bill would have been for those customers on average, what it would have been with just the battery doing its default behavior, and how Moix's grid share technology adds value to that. So what we do with that technology is to learn from all of those systems, those thousands of systems in the field, every 30 seconds, every minute, um, they send us data, like how much consumption there is in the home, how much solar there is, um, you know, how the batch is performing, all of those things. Um, and we've got, you know, just the most enormous amount of um, data there. And what we do is we apply these sort of cloud machine learning, artificial intelligence technologies to predict forward how each household one by one will consume energy over the next 48 hours. And using the same technology and then integrating weather forecasting and satellite data and things, how much energy and when they will generate from solar panels on my roof. And then we can uh, make a plan to optimize. Like when should you charge? Should you charge to cover the uh, morning peak um, but not enough to cover the afternoon peak because in the middle of the day, there's going to be enough sun. Um, you know, we're also obviously you know, connected to all of their um, tariffs. Uh, so we know what tariff they're on. Those are quite complicated in Japan, with many different time zones. Anyway, the outcome of this is that you can see on this graph um, the extra value that we add from intelligence, which is about the same as the battery would have done on its own. So we save about 14% of the customer's energy bill from controlling when it charges and predicting forward when the most effective time of day to do that is. Next slide. And you can see here kind of example of, of kind of like where the dotted lines are our predictions forward and over, overlaid with um, what actually happens. So you can see, you know, we're getting um, quite good at, at predicting um, these things as we go forward in order to make these um, you know, generated plans, optimized plans for each system. Next slide. So how does this apply to um, electric vehicles? Well, for us, the, you know, the so same technologies can be applied. So we're looking at how we apply the intelligence that we create to control when batteries are charged um, to electric vehicle charging as well. Um, and uh, an example of this is the partnership that we have with Honda um, to launch a product called eProgress, where which is their smart charging offering, which they're um, rolling out with their launch of electric vehicles. They have a, Honda have a, a very aggressive, um, in common with lots of companies now, plan to electrify all the vehicles that they sell. Um, you know, some plug-in hybrids initially and then going to full electric, you know, you know with a very quick um, turn. And, and Honda actually, um, you know, they're a well-known brand in Europe. Um, the whole of Europe represents about 10% of what they sell in the USA every year. So they're, um, they're a global brand. They sell about 5 million cars a year. They also sell about 30 million um, ICE powered devices um, and all of those they plan all of those the long while is everything to go electric as well so being able to um, affect those so that they're working at the best time is, is a significant thing next slide um, and this is illustrates how kind of you know really you know, Moixer as a company is happy to be the sort of intel inside, the intelligence that lives in the middle of controlling these things. We don't need to make the chargers. We don't need to be the energy company. We don't need to be the brand with the cars. What we do is to provide, <clears throat> you know, the intelligence that lives in the middle of that, that provides that extra value. 
Um, and this is a little map that illustrates that for the e-progress product where obviously the customers and the cars are from Honda. Um, actually the app that the customer holds in their hand is from Honda connected to our platform. You know, the uh, energy company being Octopus with their, one of their advanced tariffs, you know, all of those sorts of things. So um, that's an example of how we really kind of like go to market um, with these things. Um, next slide. Um, next. Uh, so um, another example of the work we're doing, and this is with a more kind of advanced um, you know, technology um, called, uh, you know, known as V2G. So where all of the charges we're talking about so far have been um, only able to push energy into the vehicle. Uh, the next generation of, of chargers, which are being experimented with now, are able to push energy into the vehicle, but also, if need be, pull energy back out of the vehicle. And so um, that's a really exciting opportunity because effectively you have a very large um, battery um, attached to your house, which where you can push and pull energy, you can store energy from the sun if it's parked there during the day, or you can utilize energy from very cheap um, sources or low carbon sources and optimize against, against that. So that's particularly um, interesting for captive fleets. So fleets that live at a particular place. Um, the example here is um, Islington Town Hall. Next slide. Uh, where you can see um, we've got uh, Honda power managers. So see the bi-directional Honda um, chargers. Um, I think they're 10 kilowatts in either direction. So they can push and pull power from the car, um, support the <coughs> building load if need be, time shift energy. We can use our AI technology to learn um, when uh, each car tends to plug in uh, because they tend to be on fairly kind of um, predictable timeframes. And uh, next slide and then dispatch them to handle excess grid loads together or in confluence. So we can, we can manage that, um, that resource against the uh, building in order to minimize its, its, uh, its cost and also minimize the carbon impact of that. So interesting, one of the, the rollout of, um, um, of, of uh, the e-progress product, which was gonna be first in the UK, then in Germany, in Germany, we'll be optimizing against carbon because there aren't really any variable tariffs in Germany, but the grid carbon in Germany is very variable. So we can optimize our customers for that. Next slide. And um, this is another bit of geeky data science for anyone out there who's um, like me, a bit geeky. But what we're showing here is our ability across many customer behaviors to predictably deliver um, real value from the intelligence that we, um, you, we, we do. So this is um, uh, modeling our existing homes um, with V2G rather than, um, rather than um, static batteries. And the gap between the orange and the blue dots is the value that would be delivered from that in each home. So we're modeling that using our data science team. So you can see that even though you know, um, the costs and the behaviors vary very much. These are Japanese homes. Um, actually, we can reliably deliver a lot of value with a combination of intelligence and B2G, um, helping to kind of like push that next generation of, of, um, of, of charging technology. Next slide. This might be the last one. There we go. So I've sprinted through that a bit because um, we're, we're not got a huge amount of time, but uh, we really believe that by kind of adding these sort of in internet type technologies um, on top of the hardware technologies being developed by people like Charlie, we can really um, be a big part of enabling that transition to renewables. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll take over from Chris. Um, my name is Alexis Pistol. I'm the Environmental and Sustainability Manager with Yorkshire Ambulance Service. Uh, 
And I'll give you a whistle-stop tour of our blue light services challenges that we, we face at the present moment in time. So within the, the NHS, we've been uh, tasked with looking at how we can decarbonize our carbon emissions. Uh, and fleet is, is still part of that. Next slide, please. Being NHS, I can turn into Chris Whitty quite nicely. So the, the NHS basically has been challenged uh, to look at our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And, and within the ambulance service, our scope uh, two emissions is, is mostly part of our fleet. Um, but we also have to look at what we need to do to accommodate travel and active travel for uh, our staff and our patients as well. So we've been challenged through this um, to look at the scope one and scope two, um, which uh, we've been uh, tasked with decarbonizing by 2040 um, and our scope three by 2045. So next slide, please. Um, the scale of it is quite enormous. The NHS has a carbon footprint that accounts for around 5% of the UK's carbon emissions. And we basically have to work out how to get to net zero uh, before the 2050 target that the whole of the UK has been challenged with uh, and hit 2045. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. We need to aim for a scope two emissions, our fleet, by 2040. So by between 2028 and 2032, we need to eliminate around 80% of our carbon emissions. Um, and we need to work with our supply chain to hit the net zero target uh, by 2045. But that means that we need to decarbonize around 80% of our emissions by between 2036 and 2039. Next slide, please. So the NHS has a, a very large range of um, different types of vehicles within the fleet. Um, and we're not just ambulance, uh, ambulances, we also accommodate patient transport, we have a wide variety of supply chain uh, vehicles, but also we have a huge number of um, grey fleets that uh, accommodates our out of hours doctors, our midwives and nurses, but also we have taxi services that uh, move patients and staff around as well. So next slide, please. These will go to a very wide range of different locations and we need to look at what we need to do for EV infrastructure to accommodate all of these vehicles as part of the future going forward. Next slide. So in reality, all of those vehicles can visit every single one of those locations. Um, and we need to look at what we can do to accommodate and work with our civic partners, uh, our other NHS partners in order to integrate EV charging into this because most of those vehicles do not return to base. Certainly our uh, ambulances um, will spend 24 hours out on the road and it's, it's a very difficult infrastructure to look at uh, them returning back into an ambulance station for a uh, downtime of refueling. Next slide. So the ambulances of the future uh, are not going to be diesel. We have around 14,000 ambulances across the UK um, that are all, about 99% of them are diesel. Um, so what, what are our options? Next slide. We have electric, and uh, next slide. We have uh, a hydrogen electric as options. So we've been trialing some electrics within our fleet, um, and there are some challenges with range, uh, especially to do with um, the distances we need to travel in some of the more uh, rural parts of the country. So we're also looking at a hydrogen electric hybrid combination uh, that basically will accommodate um, the range and the range anxiety, but also look at what we need to do for fast recharging. Electric will be a very critical part of uh, the ambulance service fleet, but at the same time, if you overlay this with patient transport or with our supply chain, then we need a combination and hybrid that sits between both. Next slide. So, the move to electric is quite complicated for an ambulance service. Um, we need to do our business cases, obviously, but each different vehicle has a different type of application. Um, and some could be a bog standard roll off the line uh, EV with uh, refueling and recharging back at uh, sites, um, at an ambulance station or elsewhere. 
but others we may need additional range extenders um, or more batteries uh, or looking at hydrogen as options. We've also had to look and accommodate the, the charging time because a fast dispatch is, is what we need. And in reality, most EV, uh, even on a rapid charging, could take half an hour to um, an hour, which in, in order to accommodate the, the uh, ambulance dispatches, that is, isn't really an option. So we've had to look at where we site our EV charging. And so we're, we're having some uh, installed in our ambulance stations across the country, um, but also we need to look, look at working with our civic partners um, and looking at what we need to do uh, with our hospital sites and all the other locations within the NHS to see if we can accommodate EV charging as a top up uh, as part of the system. Um, but also we've had to look at our estate. Uh, at the present moment in time, most of our infrastructure isn't uh, at the standard it needs to be in order to accommodate the upgrades. Uh, but also we need to look at what we need to do to future proof and ensure that we have uh, battery storage in order to accommodate the additional charge, but also ensure that we have resilience uh, because an ambulance service when there's a brownout still needs to recharge uh, somehow. So next slide, please. So we're also looking at the options of hydrogen, which basically mirrors an ICE um, process with a, a, a refueling station. But there are options to look at having on-site hydrogen uh, that could be prov provide part of the top up for electric as well as um, providing fuel resilience as well. Next slide, please. So, the ambulance stations of the present day uh, are not really fit for purpose. So we are looking at what we need to do to upgrade them to not just the net zero targets, but to ensure that we can run fleets from them in the future as well. Next slide. So the ambulance station in the future um, will look something along these lines with solar panels, hydrogen storage, battery storage, but also looking at the, the options for a wider environmental aspect of how we accommodate uh, flooding, um, looking at rainwater collection, uh, as well as accommodating staff and their staff um, EV charging as well. It's something that we need to look at across the, the entire system and relying on the grid is not going to be an option for, for many of us in the blue light services. We need to ensure that we have the backup to accommodate it as well. Next slide, please. So our targets, we have the 2030 phase out of um, diesel and petrol vans. We need to ensure that by 2028, we have 90% of the NHS fleet need to be ultra low emissions with 25% of them being zero emissions. Um, this, is, this is a challenge for us it, as around 60% of our scope one and scope two emissions are from our fleet, uh, but also we have a huge amount of financial impact in order to roll that out. Um, so we need to work on uh, what we need to do as a whole uh, to reduce our carbon emissions by around 2030 by 80% for our scope one and two. And around the whole of the UK, we have about um, just near, shy of a thousand ambulance stations in order to have EV charging installed. So we have a, a big challenge ahead of us um, and we need to start working on it now in order to accommodate that. Next slide, please. So. With us for around 1,200 vehicles at Yaz, uh, around 14,000 within the ambulance service, we need to work out our path to um, net zero. Um, but we need infrastructure, we need grid upgrades, we need some hydrogen infrastructure to support it, we need rapid infrastructure for fast recharging, and we also need funding. Um, as a public sector organisation, it's, it's an additional challenge to look at, especially at the present uh, time. But also we have no charging at A&E uh, at hospitals to accommodate that uh, additional top up that we need. We only have around 140 charging points in the whole UK ambulance service at the moment. Um, so we have a big long road that we need to wind uh, down in order to get to the road to zero. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll pass you back to Simon to uh, carry on the discussions. Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Alexis. 
Uh, and thank you to everyone. Uh, if I could ask all of the panelists to turn their cameras uh, back on, that would be great as we move on to, to Q&A. Uh, so thank you for everyone who's uh, been putting questions in the Q&A section. We've already got loads in, but if you do have any questions, uh, then please put them in that Q&A box down the bottom. Uh, we would do our best to cover them in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, given we've got loads of questions in a short amount of time, panellists, if you can try and keep your answers succinct, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and just to answer the question which has been asked around copies of slides, presentation, etc., slides will be emailed out and the presentation, the video, as it were, will be available online. So uh, if that's your question, uh, hopefully that answers it. So kicking off, uh, Charlie, I'm going to start with, with you. Um, there's been quite a number of questions about whether EO can... Sort of identify the vehicle or allow the separation of paying for uh, a business vehicle and a personal vehicle separately uh, through through the charge point. So can you just talk a little bit around what the tech can do and I in vehicle identification, please? Yeah, so I think it's it's a question we get asked the whole time. Um, there's a few different ways to do it. So simply put, you can in the app you know hours or, or other people's you can look at your charging history and you can select which charging sessions are personal versus business and then export that information so of course um, a bit of a manual exercise but ultimately a small way to automate that is to say that typically my charging sessions monday to friday are business and then before you submit your expenses expenses claim you can obviously deselect sessions where there was an exception. Um, that's, that, that's number one. Uh, number two, again, uh, if you're using a tool like MENA, uh, there's an opportunity to explain or uh, at least inform MENA which sessions were business and personal. Again, a bit of man manual intervention at this point. Um, so that, that, that's, that's what we've got today in terms of you know, what can be uh, possible in the future then a few ways so telematics and so you know, we work with companies like geotab and through the geotab telematics which fleets typically plug into each of their vehicles there is a, a mechanism for uh yeah yeah illustrating which which charging sessions are are business versus personal and there's a communication between the vehicle and the charging stations back office um, so it's an automatic process, again, that requires you to have telematics in the vehicle. I think the, the, the answer to this issue longer term will be uh, with a protocol called 15118, which allows the automatic uh, connection between the charging station, the simple AC charger that you see today, and the vehicle. Um, and through that integration, you'll be able to, again, automate which charging sessions are business versus personal. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Um, one for you, Sam, and, and I think there's been a bit of chat about this, but one of the things which has been a concern is about sort of some compatibility issues, whether all vehicles work with all of the, the rapid charging which is out there, and I know historically there have been some challenges. Can you just talk a bit about some of those compatibility issues and, and what's being done to resolve those? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 always going to be a challenge when you've got a number of different hardware providers, a number of different software providers and platforms, um, as well as uh, a rapidly changing um, uh, and growing amount of vehicle iterations on the roads today. So there are a number of different protocols. In fact, Charlie just mentioned one of them, which is ISO 15118, another similar standard called DIN, which is two of the protocols that, that electric vehicles communicate to chargers with. Um, and there's a lot of um, there's an awful lot of handshakes and communication that has to happen between car and charger when it plugs in. Um, you don't see it; it happens in a split second. But but sometimes that breaks down, and if if it's not a, com a complete and um, a complete chain of communication, then the vehicle won't charge, won't simply won't work, and won't charge for for safety reasons to ensure that everything is as it should be. So, um, and then when you add in contactless, which we work, we are with all of our chargers are contactless as well. So you don't have to have any app to use them at all. You can just turn up with a credit or debit card, which is as convenient as paying for a coffee, um, but there's that that adds another element of communication that has to happen as well. Um, but having said all of that, you know, one of our, our main partners in all of this is ABB, one of the largest hardware providers in the UK. 
um, for our DC charging, and uh, and we're working with them on a daily basis. To and I think I mentioned to, to one of the one of the comments in the in the, in the chat section, uh, at the iPace, for example. You know, we've had we've had lots of, of learnings to do with them in terms of learning what that vehicle communicates with, how and when, um, so that we can just learn and make sure that we've got the right provisions and software to ensure reliability going forward. Um, but it's an ever changing beast, and we're just we're constantly keeping an eye on all of the vehicles coming through to ensure that we can communicate with them properly and therefore charge properly. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, Chris, just uh, it's around the sort of the tech and the, the, the that layer that sits above the physical infrastructure that you were talking about. One of the questions we've had is around whether you need um, a charge point for every vehicle, how you kind of manage that demand across multiple vehicles on one location can you just sort of talk a bit around how the tech can can support uh, managing that situation yeah that's a that's a that's a great question and uh, and, and relevant in in various scenarios so for a domestic um, scenario with honda what we do is we um when we see a plug-in event we ping back through to honda um, and we match that with telematics from the cars that might be um, charging at the site so that we can go, oh, yes, there was, um, uh, you know, there's a plug in of this car at this time. So we match them up that way through the back end. So we don't because you don't get that information through the charge point and then you can identify the car. Um, and we have to do something fairly similar with our um, project with uh, UPS, where they've got um between 100 and 270 vehicles in a depot um, and we need to know which one it is because we um, need to know how much flexibility we have to get them all charged by 6 30 in the morning when they need to go out um, and so for that we we integrate with a third party um uh third party telematics um, plugin so they use a kind of you know something plugged into the can bus and all the vans that they use and we can communicate with that so from that we can then do the same thing but without having to go th through to the um you know the van um, telematics system because they might be on all sorts of different platforms so we can link those things up um, hopefully the next version of the charging standard will have some comms between the charger and the vehicle over power line and then lots of these problems will start going away because we'll be able to identify the car when it plugs in. And also critically in terms of managing charge, you'll know the charge state of the car. So at the moment, if a, if a, you know, a normal EV plugs into a normal charge point, you don't know what its state of charge is and you just have to assume it's empty, which means that you've got less freedom to choose when you should charge it up. So knowing that information is fairly critical to kind of like maximizing the, the value that you can deliver and minimizing the cost for the customer. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Alexis, one of the, the questions which came up, which I think you've touched on in the chat, but maybe you can sort of answer live as well, uh, around the, the potential solutions for the blue light and whether there's things like battery swap out and I guess also the, the hydrogen piece, um, the, the views on, on those various technologies as potentially a solution to the unique challenges that you have in, in a blue light environment? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different solutions that we need to investigate. Um, and I think time is, is part of the, the challenge that we've got. I, I know Shell have been looking at um, re basically a refueling, battery refueling situation where they put um, liquid back in uh, that's uh, fully charged. So uh, there's there's lots of options that uh, should come to market at some point. It's just, we need to look at the infrastructure and even with battery um, takeout systems, we need to look at that kind of full circular economy process to ensure that we're not just generating a new pile of battery waste that goes with it as well. Um, but I, I, we're really keen to kind of work with anybody who's who's looking at new technologies, and uh, we've gone through various Innovate UK bits, uh, bids and things. So anything that uh, is going, there's a, an ambulance innovation hub that will be looking at the kind of blue light services um, <clears throat> and looking at how we can work with the police and the fire service to look at all of these challenges. But at the same time, you know, everybody's got the same challenges the same issue so it's it's a kind of knowledge sharing across the board for everybody as we can move forward as well 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, there's been, I'll try and group these together because there's a, a load of similar questions and Charlie, Sam, maybe may sort of respond back on some of this, which is around the, the costs of the various sort of reimbursement mechanisms and, and charging options that we've had. So we've been asked about the, the cost of the MENA solution, uh, the tariff charges that, that are associated with that, whether we can uh, aggregate uh, the, the, the various supply um, sorry, the supply from different uh, electricity providers, and if you swap, how that can be, be managed, and then how you bring together all of these various charging streams, uh, home, workplace, uh, public, and actually you know, reimburse or, or deduct those costs from drivers. So uh, there's, there's a lot of different questions which are in a similar theme. So Charlie, can I come to you first for your stab? Sam, anything you've got to add? And then I'll try and just add a few points from a, a fleet operator point of view. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously with, with, uh, with MENA, there is a charge. Uh, we have a couple of different options regards payment. There's a typically a five pound per driver per month charge. Um, in, a, in a public charging environment, there's also a small uplift on the per kilowatt hour price. I believe it's three pence per kilowatt hour. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's the cost. I think if you look at that and then compare it against having a person or people in-house managing this through data extraction and then, yeah, kind of more manually reimbursing, I think clearly it, it becomes actually quite a cost-effective solution, at least initially. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, any thoughts from from you on the? Yeah, it's it's a complicated one, isn't it? In terms of um, the best strategy to try and um, try and account for things uh, appropriately, and I think Chris highlighted it earlier in terms of using telematics potentially as one solution to try and help with the the transfer of data, whether that be at, at home or or in a fleet environment. Um, I mean, I think there's things like you know simple RFID cards which help to determine one one type of account to another, um, both at home or or on the move is is one mechanism, um, just to ensure that you're using the right the payments solution, whether you're using our um, uh, home or, or work related energy, um, and we're also uh, developing plans in the background to turn convert the vehicles into the wallets as well, um, and ensure that the vehicle itself is the thing that's that's generating the transactional process akin to what Tesla do now on the supercharger network. Um, that takes away any any issues with needing apps or or, um, or any abuse of the system from anybody in terms of trying to use use the wrong um, energy um, uh, in the wrong way. So I think there's lots of different ways of looking at it. Um, there's also the, the, the complication around expenses and pence per mile um, from HMRC, which is typically calculated on on 15 pence a kilowatt hour and four pence a mile, I believe, from memory. Whereas if you're a if you're a um, uh, an employee that's traveling around a lot and using the public network that four pence a mile doesn't cover your costs so um, i think there's a lot needs to be done in terms of trying to work out the best way of, of auditing all of this uh, and also making it um fair so that people are able to expense um, the right values for the amount of energy they're consuming great thank you very much and i'll just try and give a quick sort of summary from a fleet operator point of view I mean, the approach that we've taken is to basically aggregate all of those costs of electricity across the different routes so i mean I think charlie and sam have, have talked to about what those kind of routes are but we we have all of that uh, electricity costs and so in the same way that you would for diesel we can understand for each driver what their total charging cost is for the month uh, and then we continue to do mileage capture for people who've got private use as we would have done with diesel vehicles and then do a, a salary deduction based on the uh, the actual percentage of their mileage which is personal rather than business um, uh, which incentivizes them to optimize their charging cost because they're, they're paying a percentage of the overall uh, and is then a sort of absolutely defendable well that's that's the actual cost that they have incurred for private use and so it's they're not getting any benefit in kind they're paying the actual cost so um I haven't got time to go into all the details of how that works exactly, but that's the, the solution that, that we've gone with. Um, OK, I'm going to uh, open up just some uh, broad ones. So I've got one on uh, infrastructure support and then some sort of overall what are views of the future from an electric vehicle point of view. So the first one is there have been a few questions about issues with charging points. So charging points aren't working. 
um, and they can't get you know the support, whether it be from a home charger, there would be a public charger, support um, solutions, help desks, and so on. Um, what's happening to make sure that that support is in place uh, and that charge points work and people can get hold of, of maintenance when they require it? Uh, open question for whoever wants to pick that one. Probably lands on my lap, that one, doesn't it, I suspect. Um, well, I'll have a go at it anyway, because I've started speaking first. Um, yeah, I think that there's two things there, really. Firstly, the charging infrastructure that's out there needs to be better. It needs to be more reliable. So the legacy stuff needs to be removed and either taken away completely or replaced with stuff that's more modern. That will, in turn, help with reliability and therefore the need for people to have have to pick up the phone uh, if they've got a locked cable or, or, or the charger isn't working. So reliability is key. Um, there's an awful lot of, of statistics around around uptime of charges, but um, I, I certainly know from my own experience of turning up to places and I know it's not working because there's no power to the thing in the first place. So that, that isn't logged as a failure, but, I, but it is one. So the reliability needs to get better, first and foremost. Um, and then I, the second point of that, I can't speak for other charge point operators, but but certainly we use the AA now as our, as our call centre and we're measuring response times in seconds, not minutes, to ensure that we've got and then they are able to tap into our systems in order to see where people are, what charges they're using, reset charges, etc. If there's an issue, um, as well as the forecourts being manned um, most of the between sort of six at six a.m. in the morning till ten o'clock at night as well. So, so where we can, we've got manned sites um, as well as trying to ensure that the customer service response time is is as I said in seconds, not minutes. Um, so yeah, I think reliability that needs to get better across the board across the whole industry. Um, and absolutely, the, the, the customer service needs to be on point because there's nothing more frustrating as, as I think, is it Dave Bone, I think, on, on the questions, you know, stuck, having a cable stuck in a charge of a half an hour is, is beyond frustrating. So I can, I, I, uh, yeah, we need, we need to just, that, that needs to just go away because we just can't have that in the future. Right. Anything, anyone else wants to add, Charlie, or I suppose particularly looking at you? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, not to talk about public, but for fleets, if you've got charges at the workplace or the depot, you know, someone like us now offers 24-7-365 support. So we can monitor your infrastructure and if a charger stops working or a vehicle stops charging, we can try and diagnose and fix the fault remotely. And if we can't fix it remotely, we'll dispatch an engineer to your depot within 1.5 hours anywhere in the UK and Ireland. So not necessarily um, applicable to, to all use cases, but where you've got return to depot, van, truck or bus fleets that are delivering parcels or food or people. And of course, this is now mission critical infrastructure, so it needs to work. Otherwise, you can't go to work. So again, probably easier to deliver in a fleet environment uh, on a private site. But yeah, that, that's, that's what we're doing. Great. Thank you. Um, so Alexis, I'm going to ask for your views on the future now, because you're really thinking about the long term. So I'm going to kick off with you um, on any growth of EV predictions uh, and the, the kind of uh, will the EV infrastructure be ready by 2030? So bringing those two questions together, what, what's your take on, on that? Your question then. Um, <laughs> well, uh... I think the, it's going to be an exponential growth in the amount of vehicles that are going to be offered on the road. Um, the, the infrastructure, I think we need to stop relying on, on public infrastructure to be rolled out. It, it needs to be rolled out, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot more home charging that will be coming in place to support it. And I think um, you and I were having a, a chat beforehand and we it's the range is going to, to change dramatically in the next few years and also the battery uh, types are gonna change. So we will have a, a different type of electric vehicle in the future that will have more range, uh, probably rap more rapid charging. Um, and I think we need to start looking at that. We're, we're still very much at the beginning of the journey and we still have quite a conversion of our, our fleets and our, our road vehicles to, to make. Um, for, for me, the, the heavier end vehicles are going to be a real challenge um, to look at stuff going forwards. But, you know, th th we need to lay the challenge down to the industry and we need OEMs to get on board with actually engaging with everybody that is, is using the vehicles because they are, uh, we can't just rely on, on the infrastructure to support it. We need the vehicles to actually be able to, to do what we need them to do as well. Yeah, absolutely. And... 
I think the one point that we haven't sort of touched on anywhere, I guess, on infrastructure is um, also about sort of on street charging infrastructure, um, which you know, is relevant certainly for those people who don't have uh, driveways or garages. They're making sure that we've got some solution there for those those uh, users, and then of course they can go to Sam's and the rapid charging stations as well. But but having some balance between those two, I think, is, is going to be an important part of the infrastructure plan that currently is not. Uh, I think anywhere near as well advanced as, as the home charging or the, the rapid public charging, which is, is starting to come on pretty well, uh, would be my personal take. Uh, Sam, you've come off mute, so I'll, I'll throw that to you and then uh, to Charlie. Um, well, just one thing on the statistics, by the way, the Climate Change Committee predicts that um, we'll have uh, 23.2 million, I think, uh, EVs on the road by 2032. Um, so relative to the sort of just under quarter of a million we have today, uh, that's a tremendous uptick over the, in, a, in a, what is reasonably a short period of time. Um, street charging, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think we need, we need charging for all different applications and, and where it's applicable, then, then great. Um, my concern is, is the number of, again, looking at those sort of statistics on the numbers of EVs and, and the millions of people out there, we don't have off street parking, um, whether on street parking is, uh, can support that. And if you've got a, if you've got a street with, with, with 100 or 200 cars on it um, in a London environment, for example, um, you, you need 100 or 200 charge points in order to facilitate that in the long term. Um, and, and there's only a handful of lampposts on each street as well. So I think there's, you know, in order to facilitate a large proportion of people with on street charging with the local grid um, constraints uh, could, could be a challenging exercise. And I think, as, as Alexis said, as the vehicles improve, the battery science and chemistry gets better uh, and we're into the world of three 400 mile ranges in our not too distant future then 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 we start to fall into the model for that we would in our um in our petrol cars anyway in terms of only needing to to go and recharge or equivalent of refueling on a on a on a, on a less regular basis so perhaps you know i think where, where possible street charging is great but um i'm not so sure that it's uh, a long-term strategy once we get to the sort of tens of millions of vehicles on the roads but um we'll, we'll see what happens Thanks, I'm Charlie. I, I live in a flat in London and I mean, I get the train to work most days. I then drive up to our factory where I can plug in at the factory. Um, but if I'm just spending my time in London, I actually got, I actually quite like the, the public charging infrastructure. Um, my only bugbear is that certain networks cost a fortune. So that I can find a charger near me which that's not a problem and I can go and plug it in once every week or once every couple of weeks. But if I can't be bothered to go and unplug it, I can get charged a lot of money, which I, uh, <laughs> I bore the pain of last oh, two or three weeks ago. So um, if we can sort out the tariffs and I'm, I'm not so worried about it, um, I might just be an anomaly, but I do think actually it's not terrible. Great. Thank you all very much. So I'm conscious of time. We're just coming up uh, against the, the 10 o'clock and I know a lot of people have ha have hard stops. So uh, I would just like to uh, say thank you very much indeed to uh, to Chris. I think unfortunately has, has dropped out. Uh, so isn't with us at the moment. But thank you to Chris. Thank you to Alexis. Thank you to Sam. And thank you to Charlie uh, for your great insight. Lots of comments coming through uh, about the, uh, the, the, the insight that we've seen. Um, if you want to, to find out more information, uh, then please have a look at planzerocarbon.com. Um, I'm sure it's up here uh, somewhere uh, on my background, uh, but please have a look there, which has got you know, all the, the mighty links and information. So uh, go there and please subscribe to our newsletter to get more information on what's going on across the whole Plan Zero agenda, not just electric vehicles. Uh, but thank you ever so much for everyone's time. Apologies if we didn't get to your questions. I think we've still got about 15 that we haven't managed to answer. Um, I tried to bundle some together to get as many covered as we could. Um, but uh, thank you ever so much for all of your engagement. I hope you found it useful. Uh, and good luck on your own electric vehicle and zero carbon journey. Thanks very much indeed and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Simon.